reciprocal altruism and tourism, cooperation and trust or not in guest host interaction. Cooperation has long been a topic of interest in tourism studies, research in regional development, alliance and marketing context based on social science approaches. However, evolution and natural selection offer a much different perspective. This is the topic of today's webinar, volume 32 from a Scott series. In the beginning, I would like to ask the curator of Scott, Professor Jafari Jafari, uh, to invite us with the opening remark. Professor Jafari, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Kazem, and good day to everybody. Uh, welcome to the 32nd uh, webinar. Actually, it's not 32nd, maybe it's a, about 40 because we have another um, ser ser series with this one, which is called the Satellite Series. Uh, so if you add them all up together, it's uh, about 40 webinars we have been doing. And we started this actually, those of you have been with us, uh, you have heard me saying that, so it would be a bit uh, repetition. We started the series because we wanted to do something uh, for the people who were really left out. Uh, what do I mean by that? Uh, when the coronavirus came, of course, uh, the whole tourism industry was in trouble. Uh, but the thing is that big companies, big destinations, big airlines, big chain hotels, they are big enough that they could take care of themselves. And the government would support them. It would be all sort of, they know how to go, they know they know where to go, they know what kind of help they can get, etc. Uh, so we realize the people who really don't know what to do, people who don't know where to go to ask a question, uh, people who have no sense of what's going on, uh, would be uh, small operators, uh, small destinations, the small operators. So we decided to do something just uh, for smaller operations uh, or small communities. Um, when we introduced the idea of the large destinations and the large chain hotels uh, showed no interest in this at all because they said, well, we are dealing with volume, uh, uh, not, not anything like that. But as you all know, uh, if you add up small operations in hospitality and tourism, that is more than 50% of the bulk of tourism industry altogether. And this is something that not many people understand that tourism is not made up of all large destinations and large companies in tourism. The little ones, and by little, I mean um, a restaurant uh, off the road uh, that used to depend on tourism uh, and traffic and has only 10, uh, 10 places, 15 places. A hotel with 15 rooms or 10 rooms, a gift shop, um, all the things on the road to the bigger destinations, from bigger destinations, around destinations, etc. Once I uh, approached one of the vice presidents of a, a big chain hotel, and he says, uh, is it Jafar, you know, we are in large volume, and what do we do? But why do we want to concentrate on small operations? I said, uh, <laughs> Uh, wait, wait, what do you do with your guests after they wake up in the morning? Um, you give them breakfast, of course, but after that, what happens? We keep them inside? Of course you don't keep them inside, they go outside. Where do they go? Those are small restaurants, those are small gift shops, those are small places, and they go, or where do the uh, people of bigger cities go for vacation? They go uh, about 10 kilometers, 20 kilometers outside, stay in a small place. So small places are always in place, they are there, but we don't notice them because they're small. However, if you put them up, if you add them up together, they're very large in, in quantity. And even the government, which is supposed to help, um, has not realized, has not waken up to the reality that they need help more than the big chain or, or the destinations that were suffering from over tourism. So we wanted to bring the attention to this segment, the uh, um, uh, neglected uh, segments, of, segments of the tourism industry and bring some wisdom to them. The idea is not to talk theory. 
uh, the idea is to talk about applied intelligence, of course, informed by theory, but uh, it's more uh, language of the tourism industry and a small operation. So that's the, the goal of uh, webinar series and practically um, most of our uh, webinars uh, stayed focused and dealt with the, with, with the small operations. Uh, however, um, we would have at times traffic between large and small, it doesn't matter. So I would like to welcome you to, uh, to the webinar series. Uh, normally we try to finish the, uh, each session in, in 90 minutes. Uh, uh, Dr. Kasim is going to tell us about the, the structure of the, um, of the webinar. Uh, and uh, we will stay, stay put until the end. And again, at the end, I will have the opportunity of coming back and uh, joining the discussion. Kasim, back to you. Thank you, Jafar. And it's our great pleasure today to have David Fennell, uh, who is the moderator of this uh, volume. Professor David Fennell uh, is from the Department of Geography and Tourism Studies of Brook University. He researches mainly in the areas of ecotourism, tourism ethics, animal ethics, and sustainable tourism. David has published widely in these areas and in all of the field's top journals and has written several books, including, for example, Ecotourism, um, several series, then fifth edition of this is available, uh, Ecotourism Program Planning, Tourism Ethics, Code of Ethics in Tourism, Tourism and Animal Ethics, and Sustainable Tourism. David Fennell is the founding editor-in-chief of the Journal of Ecotourism, he is on the board of many academic journals, he is the editor of a book series by Routledge on Tourism Ethics, and the editor of two Routledge Handbook on Tourism, Tourism and Environment, and Ecotourism. This is just an abstract of what um, David has been doing in his long journey with tourism. Um, today, uh, we are all uh, pleased to uh, hear from David and his team. Uh, and I would like to ask David to enlighten us with his program. Uh, David, uh, floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Kazim, and thanks very much, Jafar. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, it's a pleasure to be with, with, with the team that we have assembled for you today. Um, I hope you can see the, uh, the screen that I'm sharing with you, and I hope that you can hear me at this stage. But yes. thank you. We have, we have uh, Pavlos Periscovides, uh, who's um, going to talk about reciprocal altruism and altruist, altruistic surplus phenomenon in host volunteering. So volunteering becomes an interesting aspect of reciprocal altruism. I know it's a, it's a technical term. But I just want you to remember that it's, it is really the theory, and I know Jafar has just mentioned that we're not going to club you over the head with too much theory, but it falls to me to, prov to provide a little bit of a basis here in terms of understanding reciprocal altruism. I, I want you to remember that this is the theory of I scratch your back, you scratch my back. And this is so appropriate in terms of our relationships and interactions that take place between tourists and service providers in the industry. And of course, suppliers working with other suppliers. Um, it's the basis of barter. It's the basis of tragedies of the commons. It's the basis of the prisoner's dilemmas. It's the basis of ethics that we're talking about here. Okay, so Pavlos is going to talk about uh, altruistic surplus phenomenon. Ali Coughlin is going to talk about paying it forward and pro-environmental behavior. And then Zaid uh, Ghadari uh, is going to talk about community participation and protected, protecting national parks and application of reciprocal altruism theory. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm excited to share this with you. It, th this comes from a, a paper that, um, yeah, that I wrote back in 2006. It was, I think, probably the first time we started talking about evolutionary theory in a, in a tourism context as I was moving through and working on um, my tourism ethics book. So it really does um, attend to a better understanding of human nature. And I think we haven't done a good enough job of this in tourism studies. And I think if we understood human nature a little bit more, we would understand why we have impacts in the tourism industry. Okay. And we continue to struggle with that. So 
My presentation is Evolution and Tourism, the Theory of Reciprocal Altruism. Um, so just, just a very quick agenda. I may skip over some things um, relatively quickly, uh, just because I, I as, as Jafar has mentioned, it's really important to get us talking about some of these issues here. Uh, I'll attend to what, what I think are the most important aspects and then move some of the through the other things. But there's two important aspects I want to get to, and that's the sort of the one-shot interaction between, let's for example, say a tourist and a service provider. And then there's a sort of a grander scheme where, you know, if if we if we don't take care of each other in a way that is both meaningful uh, to community, then we get into a situation where there's more self-interest than altruism. Okay, so you see there are two motives to action, self-interest and fear from the world-renowned philosopher Napoleon Bonaparte. All right, so to examine research on reciprocity, introduce the theory of reciprocal altruism, discuss it at two scales, and then draw some conclusions. Okay, so believe it or not, if as we are led to believe tourism is the world's largest industry, then we should remember it as a world driven largely by avarice, greed, and self-interest. We need, therefore, to look first at ourselves and then at society when we address tourism. This comes from Brian Wheeler back in 2004, and I immediately um, latched on to what he was saying here because I think it's so very important for us. But do we really look first at ourselves in tourism? And then in 1996, even before this, tourism cannot be ex explained unless we understand man, the human being. We think about ethics, you know, from a, a ethics. We think about impacts from a macro perspective in tourism. We don't think about impacts from a micro perspective. And that's what I mean by human nature or the atomistic, the atom, the very smallest level of trying to understand our relationships and interactions. So is there a vacant niche to be filled? Absolutely. We've been talking about reciprocity. Reciprocity, you know, as you can see here through a number of different um, sort of seminal publications, no duty more indispensable than that of returning a kindness. So this is what we mean by reciprocity. Unbalanced reciprocity through exploitation, Kropotkin's mutual aid, Social co cohesion could not exist without the reciprocity of service and return service. This has a wonderful application to what we're talking about in tourism. Becker's concept of homos, homo reciprocus and Goldner's, we have a general obligation to repay benefits. Reciprocity stabilizes and regulates social systems. So reciprocity then would stabilize and regulate our tourism systems, which becomes very important. But these theorists don't tell us why people are reciprocal. So for this, we have to take a step back. So what I'll say in social science, and, and tourism is basically a, a social science, most of what we do is social science, certainly amounts sometimes to a mishmash of overlapping perspectives. When we get into evolutionary theory, we talk about sort of ultimate explanations. We, are, we get to understand why we behave the way we do because it is in us from an evolutionary standpoint, okay? And this is where I wanna to get to that deep meaning of human behavior and why we act the way that we do and why it has some implications for the impacts in tourism. So the theory of reciprocal altruism, um, so humans evolved in small, stable, dependent communities. You think about hundreds of thousands of years ago, our communities used were small, they were stable, a lot of people didn't come and a lot of people didn't leave and we depended on each other. And so we had to cooperate through repeated interactions. If we had a community of 15 or 20 or 40 people, we learned how to get along with each other. Um, and so, uh, and, and are the product of the same selective pressures as other animals. So, so pressures that shape were, have been shaping us for millennia. So reciprocity acts that, that increase the fitness of a recipient as well as the performer when the recipient returns a favor somewhere down the road. Okay, you do something kind for somebody and they'll do something kind for you down the road. So that, and that's where it sort of links into altruism. So the acts that reduce the fitness of the performing individual while increasing that of the recipient. Okay, so if you're on a bus and there's no seats and a little old lady comes on the bus, you automatically get up so that she can sit down. That's at a cost to you so that somebody else can benefit. And this is what we mean by being altruistic. Okay, so sorry, I've just duplicated that. Um, I'll, get, I'll get past that. Um, so let, let's, let's look at Trevor's um, theory in and of itself. Okay, so he said that natural selection favors you know, this is what we have in doubt in us through millennia. And we understand injustice and lack of reciprocity motivate human aggression, sensitivity to the costs and benefits of altruistic acts of others. We know when we've been cheated or are being cheated. 
I'm going to show you an example of a taxi cab in a second. Sometimes we've been cheated. We've been in the cat taxi cabs and they take us the long route, right? So they can make a little bit more money off of us. So natural selection uh, endows us with the ability to detect cheaters and making cheaters pay by cutting them off from future acts. We don't help people in the future if they don't help us back. Okay, we leave them alone. Um, natural selection favors forming norms of reciprocal conduct, developing rules of exchange. So what are the rules of exchange that we have in tourism within our community? So this is the way that we do business, right? They could be formal or informal, but this um, reciprocal altruism provides the foundation for that. And the growth and adapt adaptation of reciprocal altruism under different circumstances. He also talked about people traveling to widen our circle of um, uh, our social circles. So this presumably is another reason why we travel. From an evolutionary standpoint, Trivers talked about the fact that we quite naturally go out there and want to try to increase our, our social networks. Okay, and there's a fantastic study for a master's or a PhD student to look at this from an evolutionary standpoint in terms of why we choose to do this. So this is a social biological theory. Um, it's a systematic study of the biological basis of all social behavior. So now we have a connection between social behavior and evolution. So a deep, meaningful way to explain why we behave in the way that we do. So here's, let, let me just throw this at you. I know it's, uh, I often, I've used this with my students, but C equals cost and, e, and B equals benefit. So we have an actor at a cost to them provides a benefit for a recipient. And then what, the, what this theory argues is that somewhere down the road, that recipient at a cost to them will provide a benefit to that actor. If we repeat this over time, and you know with your friends, your friends with people because you go through this cycle on a continual basis. So repeated over time, there's a symbiosis based on trust and cooperation. If you cheat your friend, that's the failure to reciprocate, they'll no longer be friends with you and vice versa, okay? So what does this mean for tourism? If RA is a form of symbiosis based on mutual benefit over time, symbiosis should not take place in tourism. And I hope that you, um, when we get into the chat part of this, I hope you disagree with this because there's some mechanisms that are built into our human interaction that play against this sort of hardened evolutionary theory of, of uh, natural selection here. Okay, so what, what, what I would argue in this paper is that symbiosis should not take place in tour, tourism because there's no time to build cooperation. We have a number of one-off type situations where we interact with people. They can either cheat you or not cheat you. I've been cheated many times in the tourism context when I've gone to destinations around the world. Okay, so there's no time to build cooperation and there's a resultant drive to increase our fitness. And what that means is getting money out of my pocket and getting money into their pockets. Okay, uh, from a service provision standpoint. So I want to just sh very quickly show this at two scales. Okay, so the first one is the interpersonal scale. Service providers and tourists cheat each other. I'm saying this is not a one way scenario. Tourists can cheat service providers, service providers can cheat tourists. So they cheat each other to increase their own fitness, right? To include, to have more money in the absence of repeated interaction over time. So it is irrational to cooperate if we want to advance our own personal fitness well-being at the, at the expense of others. This is part and parcel of what Trevor was talking about, right? There's that failure to reciprocate over time, given that we are unlikely to see these individuals again. So let's go back to our model here. This is one shot reciprocity. So we've got a tourist on the left-hand side and a host. A tourist at a cost to the tourist provide, you know, gives money to a host who provides a benefit to the tourist. And then sort of, you know, in the end, at a cost to the host, providing excellent service, providing great hotel rooms, providing great transportation so that the tourists can benefit. All right. So if this is not repeated over time, there's the possibility of interpersonal conflict in the absence of cooperation. OK, so what we're saying is there's a disconnect here that sometimes creeps into the equation. And this is where I want you to disagree with the theory if, and tell me the reasons why this might be wrong from a social science science standpoint. Okay, so that's the first one. And the second one is uh, interregional scale. So the cumulative effects of cheating over time in a region. So George Doxey came up with a really persuasive um, paper at a conference in 1975. We've been using it ever since. It's Doxey's Irritation Index, right? That says that over time, people get irritated 
um, you know, tourists and hosts. You can see it in places like, well, you, give, you can give me an example of some places around the world where there's this irritation that's been built up over time because there's just maybe too many tourists. So at any given destination, there exists, this is what Doxy was arguing, at any given de destination, there exists reciprocating impacts between outsiders and residents and the extent to which these are regarded as irritations will be determined in the main by the mutual compatibility of each with the assumption that even with compatible groups, sheer numbers may well prove itself a source of incompatibility with color, culture, nationality, presently appearing as secondary. I often wonder if Doxy had uh, Trevor's paper that was published four years before this, his paper would have been completely different because he's talking about these reciprocating impacts. Now, this reciprocal altruism provides that deeper, meaningful explanation of why we behave the way that we do. So these reciprocating impacts are examples where tourists and residents have cheated one another from this sort of euphoria when we first get there, you know, tourism first comes to town to many years later, after 20 or 30 or 40 years of tourism, there's this antagonistic element that's built into it. And I'll, I, I'll, I know I don't want to go too long here. I want to wrap it up quickly, but I'll tell you a very quick story. When I was in Fiji, I was pulled off. I was hitchhiking around the South Pacific after my undergraduate. I was literally pulled off the street into a shop. And the shopkeeper wanted to sell me a necklace for a significant other that I had for a hundred dollars. Well, we went back and forth. I ended up purchasing the necklace, but not for a hundred dollars. I purchased it for ten dollars. Okay, and I put it. I walked out of the shop with a big smile on my face, and he walked, and he still had a smile on his face because three weeks later, four weeks later, the necklace was in about fifteen different pieces. It was a piece of junk. So here's a situation where I was going to be cheated in the destination. And then I thought in the end, that, well, maybe I cheated him and I saved a little bit of money. These play out time and time again in destinations and attractions around the world. Okay. And sometimes from a, a larger perspective or destinational perspective, they lead to cumulative changes in the collective relationship between both tourists and local people. Okay. And we won't spend too much time on this. I want to get through to the conclusion. So now we have tourists you know, at a cost and then benefit, uh, host benefiting. And then through time and pressure, when we say pressure, there's just a lot of people at the destination. Sometimes this relationship of I scratch your, scr your, your, your back and you scratch my back absolutely breaks down because there's this sort of cumulative cheating that's taking place between tourists and between locals, right? That is, that turns sometimes to be nasty. So there's interregional conflict in the absence of collective cooperation. Right. Um, and so it obviously becomes problematic. All inclusives, little motivation to act altruistically towards tourists who are high in volume and short on stay. So we cheat tourists for cheaper rooms. You know, we water down alcohol because employees realize few direct benefits. Senior management may cheat tourists because there's no emotional bond that's established between tourists and, and upper management. So we are sometimes okay selling packages to the most beleaguered destinations on the planet, never knowing our role in the social ecological demise of the region. I can sit in Toronto and keep hitting that button, sell, 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 sell to an island in the Caribbean, not really fully knowing what the impact that I'm having selling all these vacations to people at this little island. Okay. The problem is, is there's no shared memory. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission, when we get both parties looking at each other in the eye, there's a shared memory that we have. If we're not actually there interacting face to face with the tourists, it becomes problematic. We don't understand the problems that we're creating through the industry because we're not actually there witnessing it firsthand. So the implications, you know, RA, reciprocal altruism, may provide another explanation of why we go from euphoria to antagonism why there's exploration and involvement to decline by my PhD supervisor, Dick Butler, or symbiosis to coexistence and conflict by Budowski in his wonderful paper in 1976. All is a consequence of the failure, failure to build trust and cooperation between stakeholders as a function of time. Okay, and let me just wrap it up here. We can ill afford to throw away unexamined tools like reciprocal altruism simply because they, we don't like how they are wrapped or delivered. Evolutionary biology instead of social science. We need to open the doors to a more comprehensive understanding of human nature. RA helps us to understand the basic nature of human interaction and tourism research can benefit by looking outwards, not inwards, but outwards to encompass some, so many more different worldviews. 
Okay, and so interpersonal interactions have broad industry applications over time and space that I don't think we still understand. We're stuck in the circuitous loop for 40 years of looking at impacts in the same way that we always have done. We need to start looking at human nature to understand how humans are having an impact on the tourism industry. Thank you very much. So. Thank you very much, David. You're welcome. It, yeah. Um, very informative and very in time. <laughs> so I think we are going back to the question and answers and uh, our admin people are going to collect the uh, questions uh, for you later. So if you agree, um, I would like to ask you to continue with the, the panelists. Um, and uh, yeah, we go on. Sure. So would you like to jump into the next presentation then? Uh, I think so, yes. Yeah. Okay, pa Pavlos, are you are you, re you ready to proceed with your um, reciprocal altruism and surplus phenomenon in volunteering? Yes, uh, I would like to thank the organizers, uh, Dr. Rafadari and Professor Jafari, and uh, personally you, Professor Fennel, for the invitation. So I'm going to share my screen. So the topic uh, is uh, reciprocal altruism and altruistic surplus phenomenon in host volunteering. And uh, I'm going to tell you about some theoretical aspects of reciprocal altruism. And many of them are already covered by Professor Fennel. It stems from evolutionary biology and refers to a beneficial behavior between two actors or multiple actors with expectation of a return favor. The return favor might be received directly from the person who was benefited or indirectly from a third person in the social environment. And according to Trivers, reciprocal altruism explains cooperative relationships between non-kin individuals based on altruistic behavior. So this is about individuals who are non-related. Uh, it depends on some prerequisites, uh, uh, which are the future encounters between individuals. So another thing I would like to explain is that according to Trevor's paper and his theory, is that uh, if uh, an individual displays altruistic behavior in a certain social relationship, this does not mean that he or she might not cheat in other circumstances. So uh, it should be not considered as a given behavior it, and it is unstable. So the beneficial behavior of an actor uh, means that he expects some rewards in a reciprocal altruism. These rewards are either extrinsic, tangible, or intrinsic, intangible. So some tangible uh, rewards are mainly of economic nature, which is maybe job offer somebody expects. Or, uh, and the, in the case of intangible expected rewards, these are of psychological uh, nature. It's mainly about recognition of status attainment, self-development, affection. This is something I'm doing a beneficial behavior and I'm expecting some rewards. As we will see later, uh, many of them are psychological. So especially uh, about reciprocal altruism and tourism, uh, there are two, uh, two types in which it has been explored. In host guest interactions, it is uh, Professor Pennell's conceptual study who used reciprocal altruism as we already heard from him who explored uh, the perspective of cooperative relationships between tourists and host service providers. Uh, one of the findings of Fennel's uh, study is that uh, altruistic behavior in a destination should be recognized and rewarded by local authorities 
in order to foster and promote a cooperative social environment. However, there is a problem which uh, has to do with the fact that host tourist interactions are limited in time and frequency and they, they, they mainly concern interactions in the context of short-term symbiosis. Uh, thus, I guess that interaction between hosts and repeat visitors might comprise a better case study for the uh, research of reciprocal altruism in tourism. The other domain in which uh, reciprocal altruism uh, uh, in tourism has been uh, explored are the host-to-host -host interactions. So there is a paper from Q, Smith and Yeoman who explored reciprocal altruism as a motivational factor of domestic volunteers who provide uh, services to business events in China. And the other is uh, a paper from Gaderi, Esfehani, Fennel and Shahabi. I don't know if I spell this correctly who found that reciprocal altruism was evident in local stakeholders' behavior for the conservation of a national park in Iran. So th this is a difference we have between the host-guest interactions and host-to-host -host interactions. So uh, my latest study with Professor Andriotis uh, is about medical volunteers as accidental tourists and it's about humanitarian and the European refugee crisis. So one of the things that we studied in this study was about uh, reciprocal altruism, if it was evident. So the sample size was 13 interviews. The location was in Chios Island, Greece, which was one of the islands with Lesbos who received a, a huge number of refugees, especially in 2015 and 2016 when we had the peak of the crisis and the methodology was in-depth interviews and non-participant observations. So this study examined the volunteers' motives and experiences and provided unpaid healthcare services to refugees which were hosted in a refugee camp in Kios. So the results showed that reciproc reciprocal altruism was evident as a motivational factor. And uh, 11 out of 13 took a leave of absence to travel to Kews Island. They were strongly influenced by the representation in the media of the European refugee crisis. So the altruistic behavior they displayed was that they uh, provided unpaid first aid care provision to refugees. So the expected rewards were that uh, some of them gained work experience for example, some interviewees told me that uh, they handled uh, some patients and uh, they came in touch with very rare illnesses they only knew through books and the medical literatures. This was a gain. Other expected rewards were self-exploration and self-development. I mean, personal benefits. Uh, we also found some unexpected rewards which were tourism and recreational activities. They didn't have any initial uh, motive to travel for leisure seeking, but this happened after they uh, after they came to the after they arrived at the destination. And this is what it is about accidental tourists. So the next uh, sub topic is a phenomenon of altruistic surplus phenomenon in tourism. It is uh, uh, rarely studied in tourism and it, is, uh, it, it could be uh, connected with reciprocal, reciprocal altruism. So it was coined by Cunningham in urban planning studies and it refers to residents who help their co-citizens and provide unpaid work to the community. This is in, cost, in contrast to the self-oriented homo economicus of the modern capitalist societies. And uh, it is more evident in pure economies. And for example, uh, it was evident in the Greek rural economy of the 60s, when farmers helped each other without getting paid. 
but this was based on a tit for tat strategy. And uh, it, it was related to the low income, so the farmers did not have uh, the income to pay uh, workers to do some jobs. So this is why the one helped each other. So some studies that uh, have used altruistic surplus phenomenon in tourism research are the studies of Faulkner and Tideswell, Lundberg and Waite. So a very nice definition about altruistic surplus phenomenon in tourism is that from the paper of Faulkner and Tideswell. So what they say, what they wrote is that altruistic surpluses residents' responses being governed by a trade-off between the costs and benefits derived from this activity. Unlike social exchange theory, this concept envisages the trade-off being externalized in such a way that costs to the individual might be tolerated in the interest of a broader community benefits. So what is different in altruistic surplus phenomenon in relation to social exchange theory, which is a very common theory used in tourism studies. So in social exchange theory, an actor engages in an exchange if he thinks or expects that personal benefits will be greater than costs. This is the opposite of what happens in altruistic surplus phenomenon. Some individuals tolerate personal costs for the greater community benefits. And this is something that I think has a great potential in future tourism research. Uh, so the study is uh, with Professor Andriotis published in 2017 in Analysis of Tourism Research. And it's about altruism in tourism, social exchange theory versus altruistic surplus phenomenon and host volunteering. The sample size was 21 interviewees from two voluntary associations 11 members were from the Culture and Tourist Board of Sely and 10 from the Tourist Board of Veria. The location uh, is Veria, Greece, and the methodology we used in depth interviews. So, the subject of the study was the host volunteers of two local voluntary associations who provided personal services while promoting their local city, Veria, as a destination and while providing services to increase residents' well-being in Cato Vermia. So here we can see the, a map of the municipality of Veria. And these voluntary associations, the one is the Tourist Board of Veria, and the other, the Tourist Board of Sely, Culture and Tourist Board of Sely, which operates in Cato Vermia, which is very close to the Sely Ski Resort. These are the voluntary associations logos. They have got uh, Facebook pages. Some of the results regarding reciprocal altruism. So why they displayed this altruistic behavior. The members of the tourist board of Veria uh, promoted, provided personal services and efforts to promote uh, the local city as a destination and uh, to increase the well-being of the community. So what they expected was tourism development. Uh, Veria is a city like the Northern Greece, right? like many cities in Northern Greece who were hit by the economic uh, recession in 2008. In Greece, uh, this was uh, evident in 2010. And so they thought that they could uh, uh, help their community by offering personal services. And uh, they mainly specialized in organizing events and photography contests, as we will see below. The tourist board of Sely was more oriented about uh, increasing the well being of the community and maintaining the cultural tradition of Cato Vermium. So the expected rewards were for the tourist board of Veria to increase tourist uh, arrivals and local development and achieve local development through this. Both members of the two voluntary associations expected community benefits. And uh, it was evident that uh, the members expected uh, self-development and self-improvement 
through learning historical and cultural facts about their city and the village. Other rewards uh, were social interactions, and they also mentioned that they make new friendships. So regarding the findings about altruistic surplus phenomenon, both members of the two voluntary associations tolerated the personal costs, free time spending and unpaid voluntary work offered to support events and contests for the broader community benefits. Uh, they also supported that there is a moral obligation to help the community and improve the standards of living. And they, they told me that they should do something about their future generations. Another uh, important motivational factor for engaging in host volunteering was place, uh, place attachment. They all told me that uh, they loved their hometown and they were very connected with their hometowns. So this is an awarded photo of a contest organized by the tourist board of Veria. This is a photo from the regional unit of Imathia Valley. And the pink color you see on the image is uh, due to the peach blossom, to the period which is in spring. So this is a poster of a contest organized by the tourist board of Veria says, keep calm and we have a peach blossom contest. And uh, by concluding the findings of the two studies, it's about comparing the two studies regarding reciprocal altruism. So the study one explored uh, reciprocal altruism, medical volunteers and refugees interactions. The second study was about host to host interactions. So the personal costs in study one was the provision of unpaid healthcare assistance to refugees. The personal costs of the second study was unpaid voluntary work and efforts for promoting their hometown and increasing the community's well-being. So in the study one, the expected benefits deal with work experience and self-development. In the second study, the expected benefits were self-development and community benefits. So uh, I think that uh, the altruistic surplus phenomenon has got a great potential in future tourism research. And uh, it is another voice in uh, contrast to social exchange theory, which is a dominant theory in tourism research. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Pavlos. Awesome, that's great. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a nice um, continuation on from, from what we were just talking about in terms of the theory and how that applies to a couple of different, very interesting case studies. Thank you very much for that. Um, You're welcome. Kezin, um, are, are we gonna move on to Ali now? Yes, please. And we can uh, go back to the question and answer at the end. Thank you so okay. much. My name is Alexandra Coughlin and I am an Associate Professor in the Department of Tourism, Sport and Hotel Management at Griffith University. And first of all, it's a pleasure to be here um, and I'm going to be talking about paying it forward and pro-environmental behaviour. So my main area of research is pro-environmental behaviour. I come from a natural sciences, environmental science background. Um, and this has always been a big area of interest for me and it's probably the area where I've been doing most of my work. Why link pro-environmental behaviours with reciprocity, with this idea of paying it forward? It is quite well known that tourists tend to behave in a less pro-environmentally friendly way when they're away from home, so on holidays, than when they are at home. And there's a number of reasons for this. Some of this is simply a lack of infrastructure. So it might be difficult to use low carbon transport when you're on holidays. Um, you may not have access to recycling bins. You may not have access to low flow showers, those types of things. It can be a lack of local knowledge. You simply just don't um, really understand. This happens to me a lot when I'm um, traveling in Delhi airport. I can never quite figure out the recycling bins, what's meant to go in there. So I just put everything in the general way. So it can be a little bit difficult to figure things out sometimes when you're away on holidays. 
There also tends to be a slight attitude of, I'm on holiday, I don't want to be responsible, I'm here to enjoy myself, please don't ask me to save, please don't ask me to um, restrict my behaviours in any way or sort of think about my behaviours. There's also a very big issue um, that we're trying to tackle through an Australian Research Council grant is that there's this perception in the minds of hosts or of businesses, tourism businesses, that they do not want to risk upsetting the guests by asking them to be mindful of the environment. So it's seen as a, being environmentally friendly is often seen as a restrictive behaviour. Um, it's seen, it can be seen as a difficult behaviour, something that challenges the sort of hedonism of tourism and hosts are very, very reluctant to do anything that might challenge that experience, the satisfaction of the experience. And yet, we need to involve guests. We cannot rely simply on businesses um, and, you know, um, their behaviours, low, low energy or energy efficient appliances, etc. Because an energy efficient appliance is fine, but if it's left on all day by a tourist, then it's still going to it's still going to consume a lot. So tourists can be responsible for up to forty percent of resource use at tourist accommodation. Taking long showers, taking multiple showers a day, asking for towels to be changed every day, asking for linen to be changed every day. All of these are guest behaviours and all of these are going to affect water use. So it's very important that we involve tourists. So what we tend to find is that we've got two um, sort of big ideas that come clashing, that come crashing together. The first is because of this reluctance of hosts to take part in this, to sort of engage in this, often even with the best of intentions, they're still a little bit nervous about doing this. We often sell poor environmental behaviours or, or minimising environmental impacts as this green is gold argument. So being green is cost effective, it will save you money. We're talking about a business, we're talking about a biz big business generally in tourism. So this idea of building into the business model where it will save you resources and by saving you resources, it will save on your utility bills and therefore save you costs all round is often how we position being green in accommodation. But there's an issue there that you're asking the guest to sacrifice to benefit the business so that they are making savings. So that tends to be an issue. And so the second big thing that um, comes in is how do we ask guests to use less? So you can do it and you can do it well. Like I said, you can save up to 40%. I'll talk about my PhD student in a second who did this incredibly well, but it will only work if the business is putting their money where their mouth is. So if the business is demonstrating leadership in this area and is demonstrating that it's not just benefiting them, but it's benefiting the guests, it's benefiting the environment, then it can work. And this is where we get this idea of reciprocity and reciprocity by proxy. So this is a really great study done by Goldstein et al. It's um, just over 10 years old now and it's one of the first studies that was done in this area. They went into hotels, they looked at towel reuse as a pro-environmental behavior that minimizes water consumption. They trialed three different messages. They trialed the first message, which was just your standard pro-environmental message. So please reuse your towels, it saves water, uh, which is good for the environment. The second message that they trialed was um, by reusing your towel, you are saving water, you are saving us money, and we will donate any savings to charity. So that was the sort of first reciprocity message. The second reciprocity message that they tried was saying, and in anticipation of you saving us water and saving us money, we have already made donations to charity. Now, which do you think worked better? Interestingly, it was that second one. So in anticipation of you doing this that worked better. So the, the firm, the business demonstrating that they were willing, they were really willing to take the risk, they were willing to take the hits, they were willing to put their money where their mouth was, 
was what engendered this sense of, okay, they're doing it, they're doing their bit, so I will do my bit from the tourist. And that was what, what worked best. So you can see, I just want to be clear on this, this idea of by proxy. Um, so there's two ideas here. There's, there's the paying it forward. So there's the in, a, in anticipation of, and there's the by proxy. So the by proxy are the blue ones. So you have the guest is engaging in the pro-environmental behaviors for the host. The host is making savings. The savings are then going through to this proxy, this charity. So they're not going straight back to the person that you're having the relationship with, the guest, but they're going to a third party. This is what we mean by, by proxy. That third party is then generating a feel good factor for the guest so that the guest gets to feel like they've done something warm and fuzzy, meaningful by having these savings, by having these pro environmental behaviors generate positive outcomes for the charity. Right, so that's the model that we're looking at. Another model that is sometimes used in tourism is this kind of straight reciprocity where there's a direct relationship between person A, the guest, and person B, the host. Person A engages in pro-environmental behaviors, creates savings for the host, and then the host will give those savings back to the guest in the form of a voucher to be used at the restaurant or in the form of a discount on their final bill. That's not the model that we're looking at. We're looking at this blue model on the side. So that's the proxy side of it. The paying it forward side of it is you might be most familiar with this in cafes um, where you might pay for a second coffee or a third coffee or whatever that gets given to a stranger later in the day. Um, and you just get the warm fuzzy feeling that you know that you're helping out the community, you know that you're bringing a smile to somebody's face later on in the day. It tends to be um, a very good way of encouraging pro-environmental behaviors like we saw in the Goldstein um, et al study. And it does tend to work best. This kind of reciprocity strategy does tend to work best when it's being paid forward. So when it's being paid in advance of. So this was my PhD student, Christopher Warren. He um, was probably the first time that I came across this strategy personally. And he has five um, luxury um, cottages in New South Wales, just near Sydney. And he was asking guests to um, save energy, water, etc making fairly big savings, so between 30% and 40%, which is, which is very high for accommodation. And he was making it very clear to his guests that those savings were going straight to protecting um, local wildlife, particularly wallabies and wombats. And it was a very, very effective study that we've now built into this Australian research grant. So it works well in tourism, and it works well in tourism for a couple of reasons. One is because it does generate that warm, fuzzy, feel-good factor for tourists. I've helped out a local charity. So my behavior is, okay, it might have an impact on me. I might have to focus more on what I'm doing. I might have to sacrifice some things, but I get to um, benefit a local charity. So it has that hero factor. So it becomes enjoyable for people to do. It becomes more enjoyable for people to do than if, um, I've just realized there's a typo there, I'm sorry. Um, than if they were just having to sacrifice. It shows firm commitment, particularly when it's done in anticipation. So it shows that the person, that the business is putting their, is, is, is taking the hit, is, is doing it anyway. And then you are just sort of reciprocating by witnessing what they're doing. You're saying, yes, I'll participate too. It's really important that there's a good firm fit. So it's really important that whatever the business is in, um, whatever the tourism business is in. So in Christopher's case, it was an eco setting. So he was donating to wildlife charity. It's really important that there's a good relationship. There's a good sort of meaningful um, tie between the charity that's chosen and the type of business that's doing the donating. And it's also really good because it showcases local initiatives as well. Okay, so in this case, people were going to look for the wombats. They would ask Christopher about the wombats. He would say, yes, you can see them down the road and people would go and look for them. Two words of caution though, um, it works best, so this kind of combination of paying it forward and reciprocity by proxy works best with tourists that already have some interest in the environment. If they don't, then the other model, the model of a voucher or a discount can work better. The second issue though, the second word of caution that I have to just flag here is that a lot of small to medium sized enterprises 
will say, actually, this is our least preferred method of engaging guests in pro-environmental behavior. It's costly for us. It takes time. We have to figure these things out. We've got to build these relationships. It's not easy to manage. Um, so they would often generally admit to just preferring messages that they can stick up on a wall, etc., rather than doing this type of thing. I've used it in my own work in a slightly different way. I've used it to measure pro-environmental um, impacts of an intervention. So I worked a lot on the Great Barrier Reef and I wanted to test a way of better engaging tourists with some of the threats facing the reef and some of the ways that we managed the reef. I was finding that people were struggling to understand these threats and so I developed this virtual reality game which um, allowed people to build up their own reef. It was kind of like a cross between SimCity and Tamagotchi and I wanted to test its effectiveness on actual behaviors. So at the end of, um, I'll just skip over this in the interest of time, at the end of the study, I would say to people, thank you for participating, thank you for playing the game or watching the video, the control. Um, I, now, I now offer you a choice of three thank you gifts. You can either go into the prize, into the, um, a draw to win a headset yourself, so an Oculus Go at that time, or here's a voucher for a drink at the bar, or I will donate to charity on your behalf. And you can see that with the intervention with the game, there was a lot more donations made than just with the video. So that to me was, an, was a demonstration that the fact that people were actually engaging in a behavior, in this case, sacrificing the drink or the opportunity to win a headset, for me was a demonstration that the intervention was working because you saw the actual behavior at the end of it. Again, important to have a really good firm fit. So in this case, I was donating and literally donating to a local conservation group, which was working on sea turtles. So that, that sort of reef theme, I was working with reef tourists on tourism boats and we were donating to Cairns um, Turtle Rehab Center. So a really good firm fit there. We raised, um, we donated about $500 to them in a couple of weeks from this study. So we're now taking this to other places like Lady Elliot Eco Resort. They have a very firm commitment to the environment and we're sort of seeing whether we can replicate these, th these ideas of paying it forward, reciprocity by um, proxy in an island resort. I think though, for me, the most interesting area is that how does these, do these ideas play into regenerative tourism? Regenerative tourism is growing in a lot of areas in the world, particularly post COVID. Um, not so much in Australia, we're still sort of playing around with these ideas, but because it's, it's having that good impact on the environment, so it's, it's serving the local environment, the local community, it's very locally based, and because it's involving partners, which I think is very important in regenerative tourism, I think that this um, paying it forward and this reciprocity by proxy has strong potential in in developing regenerative tourism and linking the tourism industry into regenerative projects so that's sort of where we're looking at taking it next so i thank you for your attention and happy to answer any questions if there's time okay thank you dr alexandra that was uh, very um, very enlightening. So it seems, you know, after our first presentation, we've had um, a little bit of pushback against uh, human nature, really, about ways in which um, through volunteering, for example, or through pro-environmental behaviors, that people, um, you know, get, get, to, um, get to think and get to act in a slightly different way that would, go, would typically go against the manner in which they would, would, uh, would, would act or um, I guess extract benefits from being a tourist at the destination. So um, I, I, uh, we'll just switch over to uh, Dr. Zaid and uh, Gadari, and um, we'll look at community participation in protecting national parks and application of reciprocal altruism theory. Just on mute. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone, depending which time zone you are in. Uh, thank you so much, David, for inviting me, and also thanks to organizer of this uh, webinar, uh, Professor Jafar Jafari and Professor Rafadari. That's really my great pleasure and honor to be here today. I just
addressing you about this interesting topic, the security of tourism. So um, I just want to shift your mind from um, human interactions, fast-paced interaction to um, um, human and nature interaction, you know, wildlife interaction. So uh, my presentation is somehow different with um, others in terms of the context of study. We have implemented this theory in a real situation um, in Turan National Park, which is um, one of the most important biosphere reserves in Iran. So uh, I just don't want to talk about the definition we already covered um, and we presented a lot of information about the definition. Uh, but uh, just uh, um, remind that this concept is really broad and multi-dimensional concept, and um, um, you know it denotes that these behaviors are somehow selfless, and um, it provides benefits to the others. But sometimes, you know, also people they do consider the possibility of some repayment in the future. Uh, but what's the relationship uh, between this theory and tourism? So the concept um, actually has received quite uh, scant attention from both practitioners and also academic perspective. And also previous studies um, have already covered some aspects of this um, theory from the perspective of Vasquez interaction and also from a volunteer uh, perspective. Uh, that's why the definition and concepts of volunteer tourism emerged. So um, we found a gap that uh, uh, perhaps uh, human and animal interaction would be also an interesting topic for our today's discussion, um, because um, um, you know it's really important to uh, understand how people and um, uh, you know, wildlife are interacting in a real situation. So uh, we uh, actually um, we actually uh, found some you know critical issues that, that for example cooperation uh, in, in in tourism context may be um, actually uh, without any shadow for the future perhaps there is one of interaction between host and guest. Uh, in terms of the, re the relationship that they could establish. And with this situation, cheating may um, also happen. Just uh, David already covered this um, part of discussion. Uh, but uh, sometimes also we, we have a lack of comprehensiveness and precision about um, the concept of, uh, of this theory that interchangeably has been um, used uh, by volunteer tourism. So um, our context of study is uh, Turan National Park, which is located in um, north eastern part of Iran. This is the situation. It has one uh, million and four hundred thousand hectares. It's one of the largest uh, national parks in the country. Um, uh, and then uh, I would say it, it can be called in Iran as a little Africa because of um, you know, the rich uh, wildlife and also um, species that the park has already has. It has been registered by the Biosphere Reserve in 1970, 1976. So um, this place is a really fantastic tourist destination for, for those people who are interested in nature-based activities. It's a home for uh, many special uh, actually, endemics like, for example, um, Persian uh, anager and also um, Asian cheetah and, and many other um, uh, local and endemic species. Uh, the method that we selected for this research was a qualitative, uh, focusing on semi-structure interview with uh, 39 respondents, potential respondents. We uh, actually um, try to involve different people, both beneficiaries and non-beneficiaries in um, uh, you know, study area, from local authorities to, to accommodation providers, to uh, NGOs, and also uh, many other environmentalists 
who were actually from the region, so they participated in our um, study. It was conducted uh, before COVID-19, but it continued a few months after COVID. Um, in terms of uh, the result, actually, we already found quite interesting result that I will share with you only some key findings for our, our study. Um, the first uh, important study was, uh, first, for, first important result was about um, understanding the significance of the Turan National Park for uh, community livelihood uh, as a main reason for conservation. You know, as uh, David said, there is some hope um, you know, interaction between, between humans and also it can be also considered between human and, 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 and the nature. So uh, people, they found their high dependency to the natural resources because they want to uh, end it, you know. Um, this is the only resources that they have. Uh, uh, and then the value for research and leisure has been also uh, admired by local communities. So the park not only has uh, significance uh, in terms of uh, livelihood, but also it's a uh, place for such activities and also leisure activity. Uh, and then the most important thing is that people emotionally and culturally are attached to this park and then this uh, triggers a motivation in order to conserve um, the park. So another interesting finding was uh, collective uh, altruism behavior in the park that, um, uh, you know, people, local communities in the region, they previously actually they were animal hunters you know wild, wild hunters and then they um the livelihoods uh, was based on agriculture and husbandry and also with hunting wildlife but they really changed their mind towards uh, conservation conservation activities so um as you can see from uh, the standpoint of one of this respond uh, this respondent they say um, um although uh, uh, we, we are really interested in, in conserving the park, uh, but we depend on these valuable natural resources for our livelihood activity. So the wise man never destroyed the source of livelihood. So um, they uh, actually uh, had some collaboration, uh, cooperation for conservation through this uh, collective altruism. Like for example, uh, they found it, um, as a matter of, you know, duty of altruism to satisfy the uh, moral obligation. Like, for example, they participated in um, actually making water tanks for wildlife in drought season because, um, um, you know, due to the climate change, the park has been affected in terms of, um, um, you know, natural resources. You know, feeding animals in the winter time, camera trapping, safeguarding the environment with um, a kind of collective um, altruism behavior. You know, you can see here that our communities are participating in uh, making water tanks for wildlife uh, in drought season in order to um, uh, provide, you know, water for um, um, people who are uh, for, for wildlife in the region that they don't have access to. Uh, uh, to, to, to water. And then another photo shows that local people are feeding wildlife in the winter season. You can see local communities they are doing their best to provide, um, you know, foods for, for animals uh, in order to conserve them in, in the difficult situation. Uh, you know, there is some changing changes in perspective of local communities from, uh, as I told you, previous hunters to nature lovers. So uh, this statement really uh, supports uh, this claim that, for example, uh, one of our respondents said, uh, previously we thought we should dominate the nature uh, and our relationship was uh, one-sided and very selfish. But now this belief has changed among most of us. That's a really good news about um, uh, the changing this perspective. So uh, again, whatever they put, they already down in terms of uh, conservation activities. For example, they already um, organized um, many festivals like Asian Cheetah Festival. 
you know, of this first round J Festival, uh, launching different uh, campaigns in order to preserve this wildlife. Um, they invited celebrities participating in the conservation program, as you can see from um, the photo. Um, and also, you, you can see Asian cheetah already portrayed um, on, on the handicraft that are being uh, made by local communities. Uh, but uh, um, as uh, we discussed about shipping, some rivers' perspective also was um, uh, quite uh, apparent. For example, we couldn't find our tourism as a uniform in the region because, uh, as we discussed uh, previously, uh, some people they really wanted to find self interest um, um, in, in conserving the, the, uh, the, the uh, national park. Uh, for example, um, um, one of these uh, respondents, they already uh, you know, claimed that, frankly speaking, the main reason which motivates me to participate in observation is economic benefits for my family. So, you know, economic benefits is a center of. Um, this uh, altruistic behavior. You know, unfortunately, what you can see from the photo is a negative side, is a, uh, you know, selfish behavior or uh, some uh, illegal behavior or um, you know, illegal hunting or self benefits, um, which, which is against uh, the altruistic behavior and also the theory, our theory. Then you can see many. Uh, people, uh, actually some travel agents and also tour operators that are organizing hunting tours, which uh, unfortunately are killing some, um, you know, uh, species, endemic species, which are really valuable. So people uh, always uh, consider cost benefits calculation when they are participating in this um, uh, altruistic behaviors, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, conflicts is, is really apparent between different beneficiaries, like, as I said, um, you know, some groups like NGOs, like environmentalists, uh, they really consider uh, altruistic behavior, uh, uh, you know, only to conserve the, the environment, the wildlife, the park, but, you know, those people who are working in, in, in tourism industry, sometimes they violate this regulation. So a different um, perspective, which uh, rise from the conflict between local communities and also uh, park authorities, and also another perspective, which is coexistence uh, from the side of those people who are um, um, you know, doing tourism businesses while they are community um, uh, you know, activists by organizing nature-based tourism. So, uh, some challenges and also conflicts have been raised, like, uh, you know, a lot of different really actions and intentions that can be explained uh, formally through uh, the theory of reciprocal altruism. I think cheating is quite, uh, you know, apparent, which uh, I gave you already examples of this cheating, and conflicts that have raised between different park authorities. Um, uh, and also, um, you know, the park has been sometimes has been overused uh, by um, uh, different groups, and then the authorities they, um, uh, you, know, um, uh, you know, providing some barrier for, for local communities to enter, or you know, um, their rule is not really fulfilled in conserving the park. So, uh, as a conclusion. Um, we can say that stakeholders, altruistic and collaborative behaviors in conserving the national park really has uh, had increased significantly in, in, in recent years. Uh, we, we can show um, that really this, this perspective is uh, yeah, actually progressing and many people are really interested in conservation activities. Um, you know, NGOs, environmentalists, nat nature lovers, um, volunteer groups, uh, they had really different motives for conservation compared to those people who were working in the tourism industry. Um, and then uh, the national parks conservation through altruism uh, was a prime motive 
but uh, you know the other um, you know motivations have, have also been considered, which uh, positively perhaps affect the future of um, park management issues. Um, but there is some suggestion and recommendations for park authorities for government in order to restructure their participation approaches because right now the participation is from top to bottom that it should be reversed. Uh, and then uh, there should be some uh, development on, uh, on new models for sustainable development of uh, uh, current national park through altruistic, uh, reciprocal altruistic theory. Uh, this is uh, one of our publication about exactly the application of, of this theory in national park that has been published in Journal of Ecotourism. And I would like to thank my colleagues and co-authors for this um, important topic. Uh, you know, Hassan Yisfahani, David Fennel, and Ilhan Shahabi for their great collaboration. Thank you so much. If any question. Mm. Thank you so much for that presentation, um, Zahid. Uh, I, I, I see some over, some incredible overlap between the three presentations here. Um, you know, each and every one of you talked about some of the positive aspects of reciprocal altruism and the, and the element that, um, you know, the tourism industry can be an agent of, of change here. So I, I think, you know, from my side of things, you know, the dark side of evolutionary uh, biology sort of brought things down to a different level. And, and the three of you provided uh, some very interesting interpretations of that and how the tourism industry, as I say, could be an agent of change. So why don't I throw it over, um, Kazem, do, do you want to take the lead here in terms of questions and, and answers and such? Um, yeah, if you let me, um, we give the participant about uh, a few minutes of break. Uh, and we watch your video and we come back with, with the uh, panel discussion and question and answer. Okay, can I, can I just say, you know, the, the video doesn't have to do specifically with reciprocal altruism, but there certainly is aspects that could be built into that video. So I, I wonder if the, the viewers would look at that with obviously reciprocal altruism in mind, just to see how that applies in the case study that's being shown. And thank you so much. And meanwhile, please uh, continue writing your questions in the chat. Uh, we, are, we are reading it and, and we will answer it right after we watch the video. Um, here. Great. The island dream I expected. Endless beach, sand, Surf, sunsets, even fire. I didn't expect this. I've been lucky to have seen rivers around the world. I've even run a few, source to sea. So I guess I thought I'd seen what rivers could offer and the natural artwork they sculpt upon our landscapes. Honestly, no description could have prepared me for this. What the native people here refer to as the highway to their ancestors. Some call it the River of Eden. Others say it is the tropical Grand Canyon. Here in Fiji, the locals call it the Navua River. Beyond this undescribable beauty, something else lured me here. The upper Navua River is the only protected river of its kind in the South Pacific. When I was born, I heard stories about this area. This is like a route or road to all our ancestors up in this area. That's a good thing that we River Suite have protected it from other developments like uh, extracting gravel, mining, or damming the whole uh, river. About 15 years ago, a small rafting company did the unthinkable. They convinced local landowners and the government 
that the long-term economic benefit of conservation and tourism outweighed the quick money from extracting their resources or damming their river. I came here to understand how so few people could protect such a spectacular corridor inside Fiji's volcanic heart. The Upper Navua River Canyon is one of the most beautiful rivers on Earth. It is a tight, narrow canyon that probably is less than 20 feet wide in some places, it spans up to 250, 300 feet high. It has dark black canyon walls fringed with green palms and ferns with trickles of water and waterfalls throughout the whole course. During the rainy season, we easily would never be out of sight upstream or downstream of a waterfall. And I've never been in a place where that is even remotely possible. Welcome to my office. There are several approaches to conservation in Fiji. The approach that we've used here at the Upper Novo Conservation Area is with children. We anticipate that bringing the children out to experience benefits of grandparents or the elders' decision to protect the area, we hope will inspire them to continue to manage it well for tourism and also, more importantly, for future generations. Conservation is something we have to wake up to every day and say, we have to protect this place. It's never a fight that is over. Children of the Matangali that own land adjacent to the river to have to know its value and know that they have the power to protect it or to lose it. A Fijian friend told me, you don't have to dig very deep into the upper Nivua conservation area to find gold. As the stewards of this ancestral river showed me, value not only surrounds them in the form of beauty, but it also supports them. I can say it's my best friend. I treated the river with respect every day I step onto it. This is the real fish. Thanks, David. It was um, a good showcase of wow. human and nature interactions. Well, do, would you like me to make comments on that before uh, we get into Yes, some... yes, please. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I think the reason that I, I had uh, included that video um, is because they talked about this river as the route to their ancestors. Um, and we talk, when we talked about reciprocal altruism, it was about time. I had mentioned that because we have we, we live in small, stable, dependent communities, that's a really good example of a traditional society or community under those conditions. And um, small, stable, dependent community that, that cooperates and, and they cooperate because of time. And I also like the fact that they're including children as that extension of time. So that if we, if, if, um, if we value something, and they talked about valuing as well, about the river as this, uh, as this route to their ancestors, it really does um, connect well with that aspect of, of um, building cooperation or conservation or, or symbiosis in the form of conservation over time, not only for their, to honor people that um, have gone before, but also to honor those who are just coming up through, through the community as well. So for that, that really resonated uh, to me in terms of uh, my, my understanding of what reciprocal altruism can, and it manifests itself in different ways through conservation and through community building in a sense. So that's what I, I got from that video. I'd be happy to hear what other people think about it too. 
Thank you, David. Um, before I go to the questions, I, I would like to ask uh, um, what makes uh, reciprocal altruism um, happens and how we uh, can create a situation that people enjoy and benefit from this. Um, absolutely, it depends on people's behavior and perception. How we how we uh, see this happens that people enjoy altruism. Um, I can I can give uh, examples of uh, what comes to my mind is is cooking and and uh, food, for example. I've seen people who like feeding more than eating and they enjoy uh, feeding, especially uh, a chef that cooks uh, a, a, a delicious food and, and uh, he or she enjoy uh, if people are saying that that was delicious. So how we create this um, feeling and uh, uh, what are the uh, reasons behind that? I, I, I'd be willing to defer to my learned colleagues here if they want. If somebody wanted to take a crack at that question, I, I, I certainly don't want to dominate the um, the discourse here. If I ask, um, maybe I, I would like to ask Zahed. You're muted, Zoe. So do you hear me? I have some yes. uh, problem yes, we can with, hear. with the connection. Uh, yeah. Uh, you see, when we are talking about responsible tourism, um, now for, for example, uh, creating shared benefits, um, you know, the GSAF of this practical of tourism is, is creating mutual benefit for each other. Uh, because although some people, they believe that, uh, okay, I will do some favor for you, but uh, uh, in return, in the future, perhaps um, the, the likelihood or possibility of repayment would be expected from that, from that person. Uh, in uh, actually modern tourism, um, what exactly is people experience, but exactly is, uh, people are expecting is uh, you know, experience. What you know, unique experiences you are creating for me. But um, um, you, you know, in, in, in comparison, what, what also benefits I can provide for you. Let's say, for example, if a chef is cooking a delicious food, and then if I personally experience this deliciousness, or for example, it creates a unique value for me. And then I will appreciate that from, um, for example, humanist, uh, you know, humanistic behavior. But at the same time, I would like to compensate with paying, you know, some, some um, you know, extra money in order to get, you know, to uh, get this unique experience. So uh, it, it's really a mutual collaboration between, between both, both parties. It's not, you know, by virtual. For example, I'm providing a good service, a good actually experience for you, but in return, uh, you shouldn't provide anything for us, for 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 our organization, for our company, whatever you are considering. So that's my really um, uh, perspective that it should be equally beneficial for both parties. Could I, uh, could I add something to this question? Uh, yes, uh, Please. Uh, altruism depends also on social cultural norms. So August Kant, who coined the term altruism, he regarded it uh, as a moral state of uh, living uh, where the morality plays an important role in the society. So it's about uh, if the society starts to think in different terms. So it's about think about uh, the community instead of the ego and of the personal benefits. 
but uh, it depends also on uh, the personality traits. So some people are very sociable. They like to join uh, voluntary associations or help their co-citizens. But this is about the ethics. So I think that uh, it is quite difficult in modern capitalism that the uh, whole society will start to think differently. But surely there are some people who start to think in different terms. So start to act and to have, uh, adopt the behavior that is beneficial for the community. But especially reciprocal altruism, it is more a tit for tat strategy. So it's a uh, I'm benefiting somebody and I'm, I'm, I'm expecting a return favor. So it's a tit for, strat, a tit for tat strategy. Um, so I don't know if you want to ask anything else about that. Yeah, thank you, Pablos. Um, there's something in the chat that said, can, can we consider altruism as a win-win solution? And I think both of you are maybe making mention of that to a certain degree is that how is it that we can get to a situation where <clears throat> service providers can benefit and tourists can benefit. And I think we only benefit when there's this duty of altruism um, that, that we have. We have a duty as service providers. We are in a service orientated um, industry to put service first and foremost, to take, taking care of the needs of, of others. I mean, the trick here is, you know, some, sometimes it's asymmetrical, isn't it? There's, there's, there's this duty of altruism, but it's not returned by tourists who expect, who come in at this high level of this moral, this higher moral platform that expect this service. I don't think it should work that way. I think it should be not asynchronous, but synchronous in terms of give, giving and taking so that service providers don't get beaten down with the fact that tourists are maintaining this lofty attitude about their place in a hotel or place at attraction or place at the destination. Once we get that through to tourists and stakeholders alike, I think we'll be in a better position. Yes, I think that maybe tourism stakeholders uh, or the host community might could uh, create the basis for a uh, cooperative relationships between uh, tourists and hosts. That means definitely that the tourists uh, will start to know much better the host community and uh, create cooperative relationships. But it's always the problem that relationships between tourists and hosts are short term. Well, in, in the, yeah. the latter part of that paper that I wrote in 2006, there was a development of a new reciprocal altruism model that I talked about um, that was sequential in the sense that you're occupying tourism space as a tourist. And so you should create um, the environment for um, the support of tourists who fill that space. So that if we, if we arrive as tourists and are altruistic, we open the door for a greater level of acceptance for the next tourist, tourist who op occupies that hotel, that same hotel room or that same attraction or that same place. We have to pay it forward is what Ali was, was talking about. And if, if we're prepared to do that as tourists, we're prepared then to have a, 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 a better, more responsible and sustainable tourism industry that's based on this first principle of a duty. Yeah, but, but uh, as uh, you mentioned, David, before, the experience that happened to you in Fiji, you know, uh, it, 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 may, it might happen for everybody. It happened to me several times while I was, I was in China. So uh, this one is really uh, one of interaction since the tourists, uh, you know, itself and also the local communities from uh, their perspective, if they found this interaction as a one of interaction then um, there is a room for, for, for cheating you know um, um, and, and sometimes it creates um, many many you know, big challenges and critical situation for both sides but I have been as a, I have been working as a tour operator in Iran for several years so we, we will really um, discover this kind of um, you know misbehavior from the both side you know, from the travel agent side and also from the tourist perspective. So uh, I think as um, you know, I will say it, 
it's really, um, you know, the, the major parties speak about one of interaction rather than a long term or mutual collaboration between both parties. Mm. Well, th thank you. I, I, I agree wholeheartedly. There's, I'm just looking at the chat again, the chat room again, the trend in transformational travel and stepping beyond self care and stepping into other care. The feeling of helping others is most rewarding. So I think that's that's very important to what we're discussing today. But I wonder, let me throw this into the mix about social costs. I think that there are social costs that uh, service providers have to bear if they behave that way. Or well, there are social costs that tourists have to bear if they behave in a self-interested way. And I think this is the direction that we're going into with um, social media, isn't it? Is that now we can go and rate and review service providers and that, the whole world can then see um, whether or not you wish as a tourist to visit that attraction in the future. I'm just doing a study on wildlife-based um, attractions and using a system for justice for animals in that sense. So um, I, I really think that as aspect of the social cost is going to become more important in terms of getting service providers and tourists to, as we've been talking about, this duty or as, as uh, Pavlos was saying, this moral way of living becomes more important and extended into the tourism industry. There's also this aspect of alternative hedonism um, from Soper. That means, you know, alternative hedonism means, you know, hedonism means we maximize pleasure and minimize pain in our lives. Well, let's flip that around and see how we can maximize pleasure, not only for ourselves, but also for the community. Okay, so um, I, you know, I'd be willing to talk a little bit more about that, but I think it's sort of dancing around the same issues here about being better as tourists and service providers. But I'll stop and open it up to, you know, for more discussion. Any, any other questions, Kazim? Um, if I may, um, we have a question uh, asking what's the role of education um, mm. in reciprocal altruism? And I think mm. uh, education uh, should play a key role. But uh, yeah, I would like to ask uh, any of the panelists or you, David. Does anybody want to take a shot at that one? We can start, David, and then let's let's find the 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 follow the argument. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what a, what a great question. Um, just again, I'm sorry. I have to reference some recent work that I've been doing as well on animal welfare literacy for tourists, um, because we just when we go to and, and just using this as an example, when we go to wildlife based attractions as tourists, for the most part, we're we are ignorant about the impacts that we're having. I know that's a that's a very that's a strong word, but we 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 just don't know. Um, so it's incumbent upon us to, um, as service service providers, as policymakers in government, that um, to, to, uh, to to understand the magnitude of the, the the impacts that we have, not only on each other, on other human beings, but also on the you know the hundreds of thousands of animals that are pulled into the tourism industry, just as an example. So. The answer to the question is literacy and education is so important in order, if we don't have it, um, you know, I talk about this aspect of acrasia. Acrasia is this weakness of will to, you know, we break down. We know something like being sex tourists is wrong, but yet some people choose to do it. We know that taking um, endangered animal um, um, products home is wrong, but yet we still do it. And we still do it because you know, on one level, there's a, a level of ignorance, but another level uh, is the fact that we still know that it's wrong, but yet we continue to do it. And so education is part of the, is a big part of the equation here. Um, but even more education for people that know the difference between right or wrong from a moral standpoint, we have to overcome that hurdle as well, don't we? Right. To make sure that, um, you know, the people who are most vulnerable are being protected, whether it's being animals or whether people are children and women and men that have been drawn into the sex tourism trade. Okay, so there's a there's a, a very difficult uh, job that we have in, in front of us 
but it's not going to just take academics. It's not going to just take policy, uh, rather service providers. It's going to, as I say, the pinnacle of practice, not just best practice, but the pinnacle of practice involves not only a firm understanding of what's right and wrong in the tourism industry, but a firm understanding of what's happening outside of tourism, that we can bring that new knowledge into the tourism industry to inform ourselves better about what's right and wrong. Well, can I add something, David? Um, Please. Um, uh, you know, I, I believe that not only education, but also awareness is also uh, playing the key role. Uh, in our case study area, for example, when we did uh, an empirical research there, we realized that those people who had higher education, I mean, for example, um, they are, uh, you know, have been graduated from uh, different academic programs, uh, or they have received, you know, awareness workshops from um, NGO side, or for example, government organizations, international organizations, they had really higher motivation to participate in altruistic behavior in conservation of our national park. So you see, comparing to, to the past, that those people who were hunters, uh, they were father of these young people who participated, who right now they are participating in conservation activities. Now, for example, they banned their fathers in order to, um, you know, hunt you know, wildlife in, 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 into a national park. So you see education and also awareness really um, play a key role in order to um, moderate really this equation. So th 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 that's why, you know, in our case study area, uh, we found really, um, um, you know, quite uh, great evidences of this of this higher participation and motivation from educated people. If I may jump in, um, also in, in tourism, we have to make a distinction between education and training. So uh, I don't think we are, uh, the intent of the question was training. Uh, whenever in hotel schools and tourism schools, we are talking about training, it's about how to serve the tourist, how to perform better, and at the end, how to make money. Education is broad-mindedness, you know, having reasons, uh, having uh, thinking, uh, altruistic, etc. cetera. Um, I was, uh, Cosm always asked me to, to come at the end and summarize, but the problem with summarizing is then I summarize and the webinar ends, so I don't get engaged in the discussion. So if Cosm, you don't mind, I, I bring my summary into the discussion, and hopefully it becomes... Uh, uh, more dy dynamic. It is already dynamic. Thank you very much for the contributions you're making. You know, I was thinking that uh, uh, if this was uh, uh, a group of uh, anthropologists, uh, we were talking about host and uh, guest, and the medium would be culture. Uh, here today, we are talking about host, guest, and the medium is being nature whether it's living uh, animal kingdom or nature. Um, the tourists can talk and represent themselves. And yes, we can educate them, not train them, educate them. Uh, the tourism industry, we can also train and educate them. But nature can't speak for itself. It doesn't have a voice. The tourism industry has a voice and uh, the host has a voice. How do we make this tripartite relationship? Uh, this is where the education comes to mind, that the nature we take away from it, but how and when do we give it back? Just far as that, that's a question? That's my question. Um, as I say, if I was anthropology, we'd be talking about the culture. Uh, we are taking so much from the culture, and now how can we return to the culture? So my question is, we are taking so much from the nature, we are consuming the nature. Sometimes we are abusing the nature, but the nature cannot speak for itself, nor can mm -hmm. culture. Culture cannot speak for itself. Well, culture in many ways it can, but nature cannot at all, except um, we see it disappear. Mm -hmm. um. Does anybody want to uh, go for that question? Uh, yes, uh, 
the distinction uh, Professor Jafari made between education and training is important, but uh, about the sensitivity of the modern uh, citizen in regards to nature, it depends also on the goals that educational systems have. So it's about the, what kind of goals the educational systems have. Do they want sensitive and um, citizens who care about the nature, the culture, or do they prefer citizens who will be the next businessman with a great idea, uh, who will uh, thrive in capital accumulation? So it's about the goals of educational systems or the philosophy of the training. What kind of uh, tourists we need, we want, what kind of hosts we need or we want. I think it's about uh, also the goal set by the educational systems. So that, there, are many, there are many ideas in modern tourism uh, which have to do with sustainability, degrowth, who are cultivating such a philosophy. But uh, it's, a, it's a totally different thing to find these uh, ideas in some published books and papers. And it's a different thing if this is the philosophy of an educational system. Thank you. Thank you, Pavlos. Pavlos, um, if I could just, I'll just weigh in and, and just maybe talk a little bit more ethics and the, you know, the fact that there's this, we need to widen the circle of morality, don't we? I know we have. We have with uh, the, you know, the, the Emancipation Proclamation. We have with uh, women's right to vote. We have with um, the uh, U.S. For using the example of the U.S. U.S. Wildlife Service and the the, the fact that um, you know in the 1970s um, we've continually tried to push that those boundaries a little bit uh, further and further. And so you know when we when we're talking about the natural world, I, I just think it's a logic. We're on a trajectory of continually widening that circle of morality. And I look at the chat again and how the chat room again, and the, the fact that media needs to play a role and, and, and social media needs to play a role in all of this. We see, you know, nature programs and documentaries on TV. Um, we're, we're continually bombarding um, the citizenry with, with all this stimuli. But yet I, I still, I still think though, Jafar, that it's, there's an essential component of, of human nature. I mean, we, we, have, we live in two worlds, don't we? We live in, um, you know, the former world. We, we've gone from stone age to space age, right? In the last five seconds of a 24 hour evolutionary clock. You think about that. We've lived in that other world for so long. And I just don't think that we have been able to, and I'll think of it from an evolutionary standpoint. I don't think we've been able to keep pace with the changes that are taking place in society. And I don't, and I think that sustainability is such a foreign concept to us because we have lived under these other conditions for so long. Um, so it is a real challenge for us as we as we continually um, escalate into the into the future with information and communication technologies. That I just there's just all of this noise that we're confronted with that that prevents us from fully grasping how we can make these changes in a, in a world where the population has exploded um, and habitat continually um, disappears and carbon continues to get dumped into the atmosphere. I just don't think we can pull ourselves back from the precipice um, as quickly as we need to because of the fact that we're struggling in this new world of ours. I, don't know, I know that's a, that's a radical statement to make. It, it, it's a giant leap in a different direction. I, I wonder how other people think about it from that perspective. I don't have a direct answer to your question, but this reminds me uh, of uh, our misconception about some of the things. For example, in our surveys, we uh, deal with willingness to pay, for example. Uh, and I can think of uh, an example of in, in relation to nature. For some years, uh, uh, I work um, and teach in Mallorca, Spain. Uh, it was the first island that came up with, uh, uh, um, I think they called it uh, Ecotex, 
uh, echo tax, sorry, that each person uh, pays the one extra euro or dollar uh, to the to the hotel, and the hotels would collect that one dollar and use it for uh, for nature. And of course, most majority of people were more than willing to pay one dollar per night. But since I was there, I noticed that they pay that money. But when they go to the beach, they do exactly the opposite. They throw away the bottles into the sea, into the, uh, they throw the garbage everywhere. So willingness to pay and willingness to act are two different things. And unfortunately, in, in research, we, we get confused with that. So if, a, if the guest is willing to uh, uh, use the same towel, the same linen, the same whatever, it means the rest of the 24 hours is going to be the same thing. Um, and of course, if you talk to the tourist, they say, hey, wait, wait, this is my vacation. I, at home, I recycle in five different ways. But this is my vacation. At home, I take shower every other day. But this is my vacation. I take three showers a day because I want to take once before I go to the beach and I want to take one during the beach. And when I come home for dinner, I want to take a shower again. So what do we do with this uh, contradiction of willingness to, uh, to, uh, to pay and unwillingness to act? Well, well don't, don't we leave the moral cloak at home when we go on vacation, right? We... Um, I think it was uh, Zahid that talked about, maybe I'm wrong, um, the shadow of the future, right? And the yeah. shadow, and that's Axelrod's research. The shadow of the future means that if you behave that way at home, somebody's, you, you, some, you're going to see somebody day in and day out. If you behave that way, they're going to call you on that. But in tourism, there's no shadow of the future um, because you of these one-off situations. So you can cheat and behave in depreciative ways, um, not only because you're put on a higher moral platform, but because you're on vacation and you want value for money, don't you? You've paid for the opportunity to take three showers in the day and nobody should get in the way of your enjoyment or your pleasure. But I, I, again, I, I do think this element of social cost becomes important here is that, you know, as we mature as a, as a field, and as travelers, collectively, that these sorts of behaviors, depreciative behaviors, are no longer going to be acceptable. So, and I, I don't think it's an, an immediate fix. I think I wrote down here somewhere that this is, we, you know, when we, if we want to be transformative, I'll go back to Meadows' research on leverage points. What are these little leverage points? They're small little changes in the system that have massive implications for the tourism industry. Now, for the most part, we're pushing, but we're pushing in the wrong way. And so Meadows would say, what are those leverage points that we can now use to push us in the right direction if we go in that direction? The trick is finding what those leverage points are in order to have that sort of transformation. If you have that answer, that's the $64,000 question and answer, isn't it? You know, that to find out what those leverage points are. You know, I can write all I want about sustainability ethics. I don't know how many people are going to take that up, though, whether it's going to be tourists or, or whether it's going to be the industry, because that gets in the way of the bottom line. We, you know, I've often said with business programs, we have a wonderful business program at Brock University, but I'll go after John Ralston Saul, who's our top philosopher in Canada, says a business program shouldn't be at university because they have one way of looking at the world. That's making profit for, sh for shareholders. Universities about universal thought, right? About entertaining different models and perspectives and theories, right? How is it that if we're enmeshed in that type of a system, that business model, that we can pull ourselves out? And yes, we have business ethics classes or maybe one business ethics class, but how frequently do we follow that through? We talk about the rhetoric of sustainable and, and responsible tourism, but how does that translate into practice? Right, and that's the real trick here. As we look at intentionality, right, pro-environmental intentions and pro-environmental behaviors. You're absolutely right. We have the intention of doing everything that's positive for the environment, but when the rubber hits the road, it really does boil down to our self-interest again. And this is what reciprocal altruism teaches us: is that sometimes it's not about the altruism; it's just about the self-interest. 
very well said, uh, David, thank you. Uh, and he used the word we, uh, we should do this or we should be thinking altruism, et cetera. But you have to now dissect we. Who is we exactly? We the tourist, we the government, we the host. We in tourism is such a risky terminology to use. Uh, it, it involves a lot of people, a lot of decisions. You see, we haven't talked about government at all. But doesn't government have a voice here? When we are talking about hunting, uh, Zahed, isn't government somehow there that you can hunt or not, you can touch or not, etc.? So uh, this we, uh, in the case of tourism, all these uh, voices have to come together in order to talk about the harmony that uh, we are uh, we are talking about. And again, as I say, culture doesn't cannot talk. That's one medium. And nature cannot talk. So somebody has to talk about on behalf of culture, on behalf of the nature. Yeah, exactly. Um, Anybody okay. um, continue on with that line of thinking? Yeah. Um, you know, Jaffa, you are quite right. When we are, you know, talking about we, uh, it means that all stakeholders that are involved in tourism, either local communities or tourists or local government or any other uh, people, you know, uh, the things that both sides are considering is a shared benefit. You know, those people who are willing to pay one US dollar, um, you know, as a night tax in, in Spain, uh, but from the other side, they are doing some misbehavior when um, they are on the beach, they are doing other tourist activities. So it's a kind of, you know, um, um, uh, you know, mentality challenges, I would call it mentality challenges, because um, I'm paying, as, as David said, I'm paying a lot of money to, to go for a vacation to, to uh, spend uh, my you know, leisure time with my family. And I want to get the maximum benefits from this vacation. And from the other side, uh, the host community, they really want to get uh, extra or you know, more profit from, from, from tourism activities. So if they want to create a balance between them, they, both sides should be um, nice to each other. For example, um, they could, for example, provide for those guests that um, you know, they are doing different activities on the beach, let's say some whole discount or for example, some uh, incentives in order to conserve the environment, perhaps that would work for the future. But when um, I have been charged quite um, you know, high without any uh, reason, and then um, um, you know, the, the, the guests usually they want to compensate, to compensate the extra charges that they have been um, actually imposed on. But, um, um, you know, it's really a responsibility of both sides. You know, we cannot, we cannot, um, uh, you know, blame each side, like, for example, us community or tourists. It should be based on the shared benefits of the um, altruistic, you know, uh, behavior indicates. Yeah, I jump in. <laughs> David? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah um, I, I, I really feel that this webinar has just started. Um, there's so many questions in the chat and this um, um, very interesting uh, conversation. Um, if I go back to the education um, and um, I come and may uh, comment on it, you know, I spent half of my life in Iran and, and the second half in Japan. And when I think about the education in, in back to my country, I feel uh, informal education plays a significant role in altruism. And in Japan is the formal education. When I uh, visit Japanese schools, for example, they, all the kids, they clean and they wipe up the floor every day in a, a specific time. When uh, they eat, they have to um, distribute the food and, and clean up uh, the, the room after that. So, and when they are in the society, 
um, nobody's cleaning their company or their, their room. Uh, this is them that they have to, um, to do the job. Even I, I was kind of surprised to see that uh, um, some uh, company workers are uh, cleaning outside every morning before they start working. They come um, earlier to, to work and do that. So um, I saw a good question in the chat that asking that how you compare um, different groups or social groups, who is more into reciprocal uh, altruism? Do we have any classification say if for example people who are living on mountains they they are better uh, in this term uh, than people who are living in the beach or those who are in the urban uh, maybe uh, don't uh, really think about altruism than those are in the rural areas so um, uh, we need to think um, that again uh, as I mentioned in the beginning that how we uh, make altruism more uh, beneficial or win-win situation for those who give and receive. Um, yes. Well, let me have a quick shot at that. I, I, I think, you know, culture is very important, it's absolutely essential, but I think even deeper than that, we're all human beings and we have altruism in us. You know, that's that, that you know, evolution has, has ensured that. Um, so whether you live on, on a beach or whether you live on a mountain or whether you live anywhere else in a, in a city, um, it's just my internet connection is a bit unstable here, but it, it matters not to me because we, you know, humanity has to embrace this, this, um, as you say, responsibility and sustainability. So I don't think we can pass it off anymore. Uh, in terms of where we where we live or our station in life, this is a global responsibility that we have. And I also add that you know if we if we want if, you know to get to Jafar's point about who's going to take up the charge here, well, we oftentimes look to you know major international organizations for help. We have the UNWTO, don't we? And they talk about responsible tourism and sustainable tourism, but I don't think they talk about it in the way that we've been talking about it today. You know, and, and, and maybe we need a parallel organization um, that's governed differently, that has as its mission much of what we're talking about today with respect to literacy and education and living a moral life and having a moral tourism industry and providing leadership from that perspective. Because if we want things to trickle down, which they often do, we need to ensure that an organization of that nature is governed in the way that we need it to be governed that sends the right message about proper leadership, you know, for those who are yearning for it. And I think based on some of the um, case studies that we've been talking about today, people are yearning for that altruistic type of behavior. So leadership has to come from somewhere else. Um, I don't think one or two or three or four academics, you know, can make that push. I just, I just think it has to, I just think we have to have some more, much a larger scale collective enterprise that's gonna provide that push. Well, you brought in the UNWTO, um, which is a good point. And UNWTO is dealing with sustainability, altruism, et cetera, all of those good things. Uh, this reminds me of a real case, uh, and I would not name the country. Uh, I was at the UNWTO uh, headquarters in Madrid, and uh, I was meeting with, uh, uh, I was waiting to meet with Secretary General. Uh, so um, uh, the guests who was with Secretary General were some ministers of tourism. They walked out, and then I went into the meeting. And the Secretary General, not the President Secretary General, you know, in the past I'm talking about, I'm going to stay anonymous, uh, told me, Professor, I had these people here who are saying that I want to feed my people. I need more tourists. Tell us, what should, what should we tell these people? And there are many countries who look at tourism exactly in that fashion as a source of income, not conservation, not altruism, et cetera. So it's a reality versus uh, 
what we put in our, our papers, willingness to, uh, to uh, uh, willingness to protect the nature, uh, if I'm the government, willingness to pr uh, uh, protect the nature and animal kingdom that we have, or willingness to feed my people. Uh, that becomes the issue for some of the countries. You know, we, we lost a lot of what you were saying, Jafar, at least I did it anyway, unfortunately, um, with an unstable internet connection there. So if you could give us just a synopsis of what you said, that would be great if, if things have returned to normal here. I mentioned that uh, uh, you named uh, can you, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Just now, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Can you hear me? In, in, intermittently. So move on. Move on to something else. Okay. Anybody else want to re respond to what uh, Jafar has mentioned? Uh, if I could uh, add something, it's this is the uh, the gap between what is said and what is done. But usually, it's about the authorities, uh, the tourism policy authorities. So it's a. Uh, Exactly the example Professor Jafari mentioned that uh, they want more income or they want the uh, conservation of the more responsible tourists. So it, I guess it's about the priorities of tourism policy makers. And usually what they want is an increase of the GDP. That's <laughs> that's numbers. much that's bigger number bigger numbers, yeah. More tourists, more consumption. And this is what I said also before. It's it's a different thing what the academics uh, talk about uh, and uh, what is said in some conferences and what is done from the politicians. These are two different things. Do you have my voice now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh... Yes, it's, it depends on what we say and what we act. And uh, governments have, diff it, it seems they have different mission. They may talk diplomatic language, but their mission is different. And that is what we have to recognize. Uh, a sort of ironic case that comes to my mind recently, like two years ago, I was in a meeting about climate change in a certain country. And at the end, the vice minister of that country said, for me, the table of arrivals is the most important thing. And I want next year to, have, to read that we had one more million tourists. And the year after that, I want one more tourist. And that was the government talking. So who was talking on behalf of nature or the nature that cannot talk? So uh, I'm not talking against the government, but I'm trying to say that they have different goals maybe than we academicians do. Well, so, so true. Um, I'll just give you one um, example from my background as well. Speaking at a conference 15 years ago in British Columbia on um, ethics and values in tourism and there were a number of industry people there and essentially nobody wanted to hear that message nobody really cared um, so 15 years later I asked the same questions um, and I'm not sure how things have changed so do we go back to human nature and homo economicus as who we really are at the core um, because I don't think that's changed 
Um, and, and so, yeah, I think leadership, leadership and education are absolutely essential. And I, I still think that, uh, you know, time is an important factor here and just continually chipping away uh, at, you know, some of these positive messages that we continue to share. But again, we'll, we'll go back to the fact that it's got to be we, right? And not just, you know, from the academics having our own goals that are not really shared. You know, you know, you know the tourism knowledge translation framework that I worked on one or two years ago that's very close to some of the things that you've been doing in the past. I still hold that that's very important, is getting new knowledge into the hands of practitioners and policymakers as soon as we possibly can so that they can make informed decisions and agitate against that homo economicus, you know, for the betterment of their communities, not just themselves, but their communities, and that includes nature, which, as you know, is very important to me. I may comment here uh, to Jafar's question. I think um, it depends Jafar, on, on the carrying capacity. If we are uh, utilizing natural resource um, within carrying capacity, and if we have extra carrying capacity that is not used and can be used by tourism and benefit back to the local community or, or the host uh, community, it's... Uh, acceptable. But uh, the problem happens when we go over carrying capacity. So uh, I think the role of government here is to define what is carrying capacity and how it is uh, calculated. And if uh, we are willing to have more income, how we are going to increase this carrying capacity or uh, how we are going to tax tourism to increase carrying capacity or management. But the thing is, uh, as all of us know, tourism is an intensive way of um, uh, consumption. And when people travel, we, we really don't expect people to come to conserve our natural resources because they're paying. But it's about us that how much of this revenue that we receive from this uh, industry or from the people, we spend it on conservation. Yeah, carrying capacity is, is an excellent point uh, uh, that we should bear in mind. We paid for it already just before coronavirus. We had all this uh, uprising against tourism in Barcelona, in uh, Venice, in um, Dubrovnik, uh, so on and so forth. But I don't know uh, if we are, we do learn a lesson if, if and when uh, coronavirus is over. My prediction is that uh, soon we are going to forget uh, some of the lessons we have learned and we become the same consumptive individual, uh, individuals that we were on the beaches uh, before coronavirus and being the same thing. Uh, but uh, Kazim, I would like to bring your point back to this discussion. Yes, you talk about uh, Japanese education and how well they are trained to responsible for their own act in classroom and in the society. But we know in tourism that when we travel, we, become, we go from ordinary uh, form to non-ordinary. I wonder how Japanese people who are so well-trained and so well-educated, how they behave when they are away from home. They become different. So uh, tourism becomes a very complicated situation uh, because everything is constantly changing. You know, I talk about culture, but uh, and you assume I was talking about the host culture, but then the host culture is bombarded by imported cultures, by the tourists. And the tourist says, hey, this is my vacation. And so we have all these voices, and I wonder how we can make sense out of these voices. The government voice, the spoken government voice, and the unspoken government voice the spoken voice of the host community and the unspoken voice, the voice of culture, the voice of nature, and so on and so forth. Uh, some, some, some people don't realize how difficult tourism, how difficult the subject of tourism is. Uh, sometimes we say it's, uh, uh, it's a multidisciplinary, but, but that's not, it's not justice, it's more than that. Um, in in Japan, Jafar, uh, maybe I 
Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure if uh, I, I talked about this in another webinar or not, but um, we have a, um, a number of people in rural that they, they operate uh, uh, kind of a, a farmers in or farmers guest house. And when they sell their production, um, they, um, they put somehow a condition and their message for the guest is, uh, this guest house is our house, is a farmer's house, which means that they are selling their lifestyle, they are selling their culture. So it's the part of the price for people who come and visit them uh, to behave like them, to, uh, to, to cook and, and clean and make their own bed and to experience the rural lifestyle and they have to pay for it. They are not uh, allowed to demand uh, uh, the, the uh, services of a hotel or um, a kind of usual business um, hotel accommodation. So uh, I think um, in what extent we value what we have, our culture, back to your idea and our nature, uh, I learned from uh, domestic Japan and domestic trouble in Japan a lot in this case. When you uh, visit uh, nature or forest, for example, if you have a water pond, you see a small statue that is the god of the water pond. And when you go, you worship this god, which means the god is just watching and it's, uh, you are not allowed to do something to make the god uh, unhappy. Um, and these are informal education and uh, um, associated with nature and tourism. Um, again, this culture is not created based on tourism or for tourism, but uh, tourists are the guests and they, they come in. Um, they have this certain uh, cultural issues and the level of conservation also is uh, very important. Uh, and the, the, the level of, um, let's say, the association of culture with the existing nature or how people really believe in their own culture. It, it gives a, a, a certain guarantee that carrying capacity is, uh, is meet. Uh, otherwise, if, don't, if people who are living in the site, they don't believe in their own uh, uh, values, then a tourist uh, can go beyond that. Yeah, but your example uh, is uh, Japanese within Japanese culture having a vacation. So Japanese tourists who go to, on vacation in Japan are under the watchful eyes of Japanese culture and Japanese people. So th they 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 behave somehow more Japanese at home. But I wonder, and I'm, we are not really talking about Japanese. We are talking about tourists Tourist, who. Yeah. Who are you? Who at home they are in one way, and away from home are in a different way. What I'm saying is that we use the word value. The tourists may not take their homegrown values with them when they travel. So this is the the the, the job of empowerment. We have to educate and empower communities to um, to um, to ensure or to let's say, enforce their values. Uh, I give you an example in Italy. I was in Rome and with a group of people, I don't want to name, uh, that uh, they were just uh, throwing out garbage everywhere and, and as uh, just mixed. But the same group, when they, they we went to a small village in uh, north of Rome, about 60 kilometers away, uh, they were behaving different because there were different garbage cans that uh, they have to separate their garbage. So within uh, maybe uh, less than an hour trip and travel, these people, they changed their behavior because the village environment uh, was asking for that. So I, I believe uh, it depends on uh, the destination and uh, the spirit of destination. Uh, if you are a guest, you have to obey the host. And in, in what extent the host has also uh, created this, um, this 
uh, let's say anthropological or psychological environment that that the the guest uh, um, have to or must uh, obey this uh, environment is important. But um, yeah, as you mentioned, tourism makes everything, and it's bombard bombarding the local culture and behavior. So the key, I think, is back to uh, uh, bring uh, or strengthen the identity of the destination. I agree with you. I don't want to uh, <laughs> exaggerate in this uh, thing, uh, but uh, what you said is, is perfect. I, I agree with you. But at the same time, uh, think about uh, hotel schools and tourism schools. What do we teach the students? We teach them that the tourists or the customers are always right. We, we teach them that, that you dance to the music of the tourists, not the host, not the values. All right, Kazem, I think uh, we have gone way beyond our time limit and yes. uh, everybody may become tired. Uh, I guess uh, our dialogue was a sort of uh, summary uh, of uh, some of the things we have talked and new questions that we raised uh, uh, for future explorations on this webinar series or in some other places. We, at the beginning, uh, we started with the host and guest. Um, it's in the abstract of the webinar and uh, we talked, uh, 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 we had it at the beginning, but uh, during the discussion, um, we less frequently use the term host and guest and we got into the subject matter. And one thing that I, uh, in host and guest uh, and the word reciprocity, reciprocity in tourism is, uh, the name of that is hospitality. The give and take uh, between host and guest. Uh, so in a way we should talk about hospitality as well, but uh, we did not get that chance. However, the, the opportunity is lost uh, at the end of this month. We do have a webinar with hospitality as a theme. I invite you to join that one. Uh, it may not be about nature. It may not be about animal kingdom, but it is more about hospitality and how to dish out hospitality um, in a way that uh, pleases the host and pleases the guests. Um, Hospitality, uh, if it is well-maintained, remains hospitality warm and rewarding, but uh, the experiences we had with over-tourism, too many tourists, uh, commercialization of tourism, we know that uh, hospitality gradually changes to hostility. You know, the two terms are, uh, in a way, they sound alike, but they're opposite to each other. Uh, and I don't know uh, if we have learned a lesson from uh, a pre-coronavirus situation that hospitality was uh, being born in the in the lands of hospital hostility was being born in the land of hosp hospitality. I hope we have learned those lessons of the before coronavirus. I hope we have learned some lessons during the coronavirus, and I hope uh, the tourism post coronavirus is going to be a different type of tourism, gentle. Uh, uh, respectful, to, respectful to nature and culture. And uh, I, I hope uh, some of the things we talked about today, we will uh, bring to our classrooms and make it uh, uh, a subject of discussion for the future generation uh, of hospitality and tourism leaders. And I, I come back to you, Cousin, for your closing remarks, for your closing points. Um, thank you, Jafar. Uh, I would like really to thank uh, David and his team that they brought up this wonderful discussion and this topic. And I feel that it's uh, um, a, a big demand with uh, our uh, audience uh, to continue this discussion with another webinar. And we want uh, to invite you to continue this. And our uh, audience, I would like to invite you to comment on our YouTube channel and uh, the event page in LinkedIn um, and continue this good discussion. Um, thanks all. We are uh, almost one hour beyond our uh, original time and I see 
uh, many of our audience are still there and listening to us. I would like to thank all of you again and uh, hope to see you uh, in the future um, Scott webinars. Um, I also thank uh, David, uh, our good friend David and uh, the team uh, 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 for uh, the panelists, uh, for the contribution you made to this dialogue. And of course, uh, thanking those who, who stayed with us all the way from the beginning to the end. Thank you. And please join us again in the future webinars. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, uh, Jafar, for your leadership with all of this. And uh, Kazim, for your facilitation. And uh, to, to my colleagues, Pavlos and, um, and Alexandra and Zahed, um, Thank, thanks for jumping on board. This has been fantastic. I, I'm, I'm very thankful that you've, uh, you've, uh, you've helped out with, uh, with today. So appreciate that. I would just also say to the, to the people who've been online, if, if you have any questions that we haven't got to, please feel free to reach out and see if we can address those as we move forward. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.